So, we're on Hosea chapter 10. And as I was uh, studying this, again, I see the parallel to what happened to ancient Israel to what's happening with America today. And what I'll do once I'm all done with this study, I'll put it together like in one syllabus of notes and stuff and edit it. So it'll be like in one book form. Alvino, Cain, our Father, King, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that this is a day that you have made. Father, we thank you that we can come together on Shabbat, no matter how big or how small, that we can come together and study your word, Father, and that we know we're two or more gathered in your name, that you are here, Father, among us. We thank you, your angels encamp around about us, Father, that you keep us safe, Father, and we just thank you that uh, we will not be discouraged, Father, but we are looking forward to everything that you're going to do, Father, in our lives in these latter days that, and end of days that we are living in. In Yeshua's name, amen. What I'm going to do is just kind of key in on some key verses in chapter 10 as I was studying because I have a lot to share, so I want to make sure that I get everything in. So just as an intro, again, this is from the book Treasar, having foretold the great tragedies that were to befall the nation of Israel, including even the annihilation of her children, the prophet now goes on to describe the iniquitous acts which caused these terrible decrees. Our banal, following his approach to the previous verses, that they refer to specifically to the sin of promiscuity, Arbanel adds that in this chapter, the prophet continues on to the other cardinal sin of which they were guilty, which is idolatry. And actually, idolatry and sexual sin go hand in hand, because that was part of the practice of idolatry, was sexual sin. So verse 1, Hosea 10, 1, A luxuriant vine is Israel, who produces fruit for himself. Like the abundance of his fruit, he has multiplied his altars, like the goodness of his land, they made beautiful sacred pillars. Israel is similar to a vine that eliminates its own fruit, i.e. by withholding a yield or alternatively by causing its fruit to drop. What is the fruit which the vine of Israel has eliminated? The fruit of divine service, the ways of righteousness, wealth and progeny, and actual produce of the fields. Again, I see, you know, I see the parallel with you know America, I mean God has prospered this country. He has blessed this country, and instead of going you know more towards God, we have started to go farther away from God. Indeed, the more I bestowed upon them my blessing of plenty, Arbanel suggests that the fruit refers to the offspring whose behavior followed that of their fathers. You know, it talks about that. Uh, the sin of the father will follow every, you know, every, you know, third up to the third and fourth generation, so that their children were following in their footsteps, which is of pagan worship and not following God. The more they prepared calves for their idolatrous altars, and the more I blessed their land with an abundance of produce, the more they improved, strengthened, and increased the pillars that they erected to their false gods. So they used the blessings of Hashem for evil instead of for good. Again, we see that going on in this country. Hosea 10.2, their heart became smooth. Now they will bear their guilt. He will break down their altars and he will destroy the sacred pillars. In other words, smooth means their heart was divided. Their hearts have parted from me and my Torah. Their turning away from me shall bring about the destruction of their altars and the plunder of the very pillars into which they have invested as much energy and wealth. Uh, I mean, Ezra explains that the parting of their hearts to me that they have split their loyalty between Hashem and other deities. Go to uh, 1 Kings 18.21. And here we have the words of the prophet Elijah saying the same things to Israel. Uh, let's begin with verse 20, 18, 1 Kings 18, verse 20. 
So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Now Ahab was the husband of Jezebel. Uh, they were wicked rulers and brought Israel into idolatry. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. The, but the people did not answer him a word. So here again, Elijah is challenging them, you know, decide who you're going to serve today. You know, uh, Joshua, in fact, another scripture, if you look at Joshua 25, that just scripture just came to me, it's not in the notes there, but Joshua 25, actually the last chapter of uh, Joshua uh, 24, 15. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served, which are beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we will forsake the Lord to serve other gods. But now you fast forward to the time of Hosea and to the time of the, pro the prophets. We see them doing exactly that, going after other gods, forgetting who their prosperity was from. Hosea 10.5, the inhabitants of Samaria will quarrel over the calves of Beth Aven. Indeed, its people will mourn over it, but its priests will tremble over it, for its glory will surely depart from it. Beth Aven is the city of Bethel, where one of the two calves were erected by Jeroboam was placed. It is called Beth Aven, as in the book of Joshua 7.3. Alternatively, this is a pejorative nickname city of iniquity given to it by the prophets because of the activities that took place there so in other words he's calling the inhabitants of samaria they're calling the place of samaria again a city of iniquity and just as a reminder hosea is the prophet to the northern tribes he's, he's speaking to the northern tribes who, the ten tribes who had broken away from judah set up their own place of worship set up their own uh, idolatrous practices and, he's, and again, he's warning him again, you know, judgment is coming. Hosea 10.8 The high places of Aven, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. Thorns and thistles will come up on their altars, and they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. And in their hour of great humiliation, the people cry out to the mountains, cover us, and they will beg the hills to fall upon us, and thereby conceal us. We see those same words in the book of Revelation referring to the end of days in the tribulation period in Revelation 6, 14 to 17. The heaven ripped apart like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the military commanders and the rich and the mighty and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they tell the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So in, in the same way in the end of days that people are going to be asking because of the judgment that's coming upon the world, they're going to actually ask the, the, you know, the, the mountains to fall on them and hide them from God's wrath. But you know what? Nothing's going to be able to hide them from God's wrath. The only thing that's going to hide a person from God's wrath is repentance. Hosea 10.12, sow for yourself, now this is, a, this is a key verse, and I'm really zeroing in on this. Sow for yourselves righteousness, in other words, what will it take to avert judgment? Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in accord with covenant love. Break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek Adonai until he comes and showers righteousness on you. We see the continuation of the image in Hosea 10:11. Act righteously, and you shall reap the reward—a reward not of debt, but it of grace. So again, key words talks, talking about um, walking in mercy, according to the measure of the divine mercy, which over and above repays the goodness or mercy which we show to our fellow man. Uh, Luke, let's look at Luke 6:38 real quick.
Hallelujah. And here again it's talking about um, sowing. Give and it will be given unto you. They will pour onto your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured and returned to you. And that's not just talking about uh, financially, but it's how you treat people. It's going to come back to you. In other words, whatever you sow, you're going to reap back. Also, we are to break up our fallow ground, telling them, remove your superstitions and vices and be renewed. Seek the Lord fill, full till he comes. Though not answered immediately, persevere unceasingly till he comes. In other words, to continually be faithful until he returns. Even if he doesn't return in our lifetime, we're to be faithful as if he's returning today. Then it talks about rain. Rain is a type of blessing and righteousness, the reward of righteousness that is salvation, temporal, and spiritual. Let's go on. So let's look at that word sow. So what we need is not just national repentance, but first it has to start with the individual. Okay? The individual, the home, from the home to the the community, from the community, the congregation, and then to the nation. Um, again, it starts with us individually. And, you know, again, Hosea is talking to Israel, who was a nation set apart by God. And God, you know, tells them that if you walk in obedience to, be, to me, you are going to be blessed. Deuteronomy 28 talks about the curses and the blessings. And even though in the midst of all this unrighteousness, God always had... Uh, a group, a remnant of people that served him. But unfortunately, the land was still judged because the whole nation didn't repent. But God did preserve the righteous, even, you know, when they were going out, you know, into um, captivity. We see that with, in Babylon, we see um, Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah, righteous men, uh, godly men, Ezra, who went into captivity with, with Judah um, and God blessed them and gave them favor, and God sent them to keep Judah from getting farther into sin and not to forget who they are. And that's the remnant's job, is to remind God's people of who they are and who they belong to. You know, a lot of times they're referred to in, in uh, Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation that um, America is referred to as... Um, spiritual Babylon um, but you know again the revelation it's like you kind of understand some things in scripture as it unfolds but as we look at again the comparison of what God is telling ancient Israel what's going on today we can't help but to see the similarities okay that word for sow is zara and it's a verb meaning to sow to bear seed it indicates the act of sowing the ground or field or a planting of seed. Uh, the verb can take two objects and mean to sow a city with salt. It is used figuratively of sowing the wind, and it is a product of a plant or tree that produces its own seed in itself. You can look up these scriptures later, again referring to this word sowing. Again, sow for yourselves in righteousness. The word righteousness is zadika. It's a feminine noun meaning righteousness, blameless conduct, and integrity. The noun describes justice, right actions, and right attitudes as expected from both God and people when they judge. God came speaking justice and righteousness as a divine judge. Again, the judges of Israel were to judge righteously according to the Torah. They were not to take a bribe. They were not to give favor to somebody because he was richer and and. Uh, non favor to somebody who was poor, they were to judge righteously according to the Torah. The word describes the attitude and actions God had and expected his people to maintain. He is unequivocally righteous. Righteousness is entirely his prerogative. His people are to sow righteousness and they will receive the same in return. And the other word is reap, katsar, it means to reap a harvest. If you sow and you, you, know, you break up the ground, you sow the seed, those seed is watered and sun hits it, you're going to reap, you're going to reap a harvest. 
negatively and positively. If we do negative things, we're going to reach, you know, we get a harvest of negative things. Okay, two, we are to reap in mercy. This means to accept and appropriately, appropriately the mercy of God extended to us. If we do not accept mercy from God, it will not be ours. For both sowing in righteousness and reaping in mercy is our responsibility. Again, the only way to receive mercy from God is to repent and to, and to serve Him and receive His forgiveness and receive His mercy. But again, we have to do it. His mercy is there. His mercy is always calling. His forgiveness is always there. But we have to take on the responsibility of receiving that mercy and repenting. Righteousness is here to do, and mercy is here to receive. But neither will be a man's experience until he does what is right and accepts the mercy provided. Let's go to uh, Matthew 5, verse 7. You know, and it's the same thing. It's, you know, uh, faith without works is dead. You know, you could sit in your house and, you know, and God will say, hey, I want you to do this. But until you actually get up and do it, you're not going to reap the blessings from obedience. 5 verse 7 says, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Go to Mark 11, 25 and 26. And at that time, Yeshua said, I praise you, Father. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. I'm looking at Matthew. <laughs> Mark. Oh, yeah. Let's see, 25 and 26. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. So that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive your transgress transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is heaven forgive your transgressions. Now 66 is in uh, brackets because some manuscripts don't carry that verse. So they say, well, you know, well, uh, some have that verse and some don't. But again, we have to forgive in order to receive forgiveness because God has forgiven us of so much. We are to break up our follow ground. That word for uh, break up is, or follow is near. It means tillable, untilled, or follow ground. This is also the work of man. Each must break up the ground of his own life. Follow ground is that which has been plowed but not sown. Ground not in use. I, um, idle ground is crusted over and hardened until it needs to be broken up again to receive seed. And I'm sure you've seen that. If you've seen you know, a, a piece of, of ground that hasn't been, he has no grass in it, he has nothing's done to it. it, it's all cracked and hard, you know, and you have to, if you want something to thrive in it, you've got to break it up. You've got to pull the wheat, you've got to make it so it'll receive the seed. If you just throw it on hard ground, it's not going to do anything. Let's look at Mark 4, and here Yeshua gives the example, and this is really talking about a hardened heart. Israel's heart had become, become hardened even to the words of the prophets. I mean, they warned them and they warned them. But they thought, oh, nothing's going to happen. And here this is an explanation again of the parable that Yeshua was teaching of the sower and the word. Verse 13, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown, and when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who, when they heard the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they will fall away. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. 
And those are the ones in whom the seed was sown on the good soil, that they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. So here Yeshua is showing different types of hearts that receive the word. And here we see the prophets um, speaking to Israel. We know that Yeshua, sure there had to be some in there that were receiving what he had to say, but the majority's hearts were hardened. And they wouldn't receive the word. Satan comes immediately. How does he come? We, we talked uh, last week about false prophets coming to contradict, you know, to tickle their ears and contradict what the prophets of God were saying. You know, or even, you know, they hear the word, you know, again, they'll come here. You know, people will come here. Oh, and, you know, wow, this teaching is great. Oh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep on coming here. And then before you know it, they're gone and they don't show up again. It's like, you know, they're someplace else, and they bounce from place to place, never getting settled, never taking root, always looking for something to tickle their ears. You don't grow that way. You have to find a place where God wants you to be and grow, be a part of that community um, so that your gifts can be used in that community. But people's, again, people's hearts get hardened or they get easily offended. And they, you know, they, well, you offended me. You looked, I've had people say, well, you didn't say hi to me and wouldn't come back. It's like, really? It's, you know, maybe my mind was someplace else. But again, we see that. We've had, you know, people come and go, but we have to remain faithful to do what God's called us to do. We have to remain faithful to preach the word and teach the word the way God's called us to do it, whether people, you know, receive it or not. You know, my job is to give them the word. It's the Ruach HaKodesh's job to bring conviction, to bring understanding. You know, and a lot of times we have to check our own heart because our heart can become hardened by stubbornness, by unforgiveness, by anger towards God because we feel that God hasn't answered some of our prayers as quickly as he should have. We have to, you know, constantly be checking our hearts and not be drawn away drawn away to, you know, an idol is anything that comes before God in your life. Anything that you give more uh, priority to than your relationship with God. You know, and anything that takes you away from the word and causes you to compromise. But again, we see God's mercy is constantly de dealing with us. We see God's mercy constantly dealing with Israel, giving them a chance to repent. But we see that the northern tribes, and, you know, and the prophet warned them, you know, that gold, those golden idols that you are so fond of, that you use the blessings of God to move, Assyria is going to come in and take those idols from you and use them for their own purposes. So our hearts uh, and will must be broken and yielded to God. We must make ourselves will to receive the word of God and to obey it, or seeking him will not avail us anything. Go to Matthew 13, 3 to 12. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Again, we see this in, in ancient Israel. We see that they didn't understand what the prophets were saying. They heard it, but they didn't hear it. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and their ears they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes, otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. Again, bringing that word return back to the Hebrew is teshuva. Let's go to uh, verses 18 to 23. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away which he has been sown in his heart. This is uh, the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary, and when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. You know, that happens to new believers. You know, they're so excited about Yeshua. They're so excited about the word, but all of a sudden the persecution comes, and they can't deal with it, and they fall back into the world. 
You know, believe me, but when you are truly born again, you don't care about the persecution. When I truly gave my heart to the Lord, I could care less if my friends in the world liked me or not anymore. Because you know what? They all fled. They weren't there, you know, when I needed them. They were only there for a good time. You know, you know who your friends are, you know, when, when times are tough. But when I gave my heart to the Lord, I said, you know, Father, I don't care, if, you know, if my friends flee from me. But, you know, God has blessed me in return with, you know, greater friends. My husband, my best friend. You know, the people that come into this ministry, ministry friends of mine. Again, affliction and persecution is going to come for the word's sake. Affliction and persecution is going to come because you're deciding to follow the Torah of Yahweh. You're deciding to follow in the footsteps of Yeshua. You're deciding to worship on Shabbat. You're deciding to keep his feast and do things that are not the norm. And people are going to question you. That's why we need to learn so we can speak the truth in love and explain things to them in the way they understand. But a lot of times, even in this walk, you know, people, you know, turn away. People, you know, get, uh, again, offended easily. Verse 21, uh, verse 22, And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. You know, again, they, you know, because there's a lifestyle change when you make a decision to follow God. And there's some decisions we have to make regarding even our jobs, what we will or will not do on Shabbat, what we will or will not do um, on, the, on the feast, you know, on his feast days. And we, well, if I don't work, I need the money. Well, you know what? You trust God. He'll bless you doubly. Is somebody down there? Okay. All right. Well, I'll just let him in. Hallelujah. Verse 23, And the one whom the seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some 100, some 60, and some 30-fold. So if we hang in there, we're going to bear fruit. You know, just like when you plant a seed, that seed doesn't, you know, pop up tomorrow, but eventually it's going to bear fruit. Let's go to James chapter 1. Okay, James chapter 1, verses 18. We'll read 18 and verse 21. Let's begin with verse 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. And then verse uh, 21 Therefore put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility. Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not mere, merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately for has forgotten what kind of person he was. So again, we have to keep on having a pop up here. There's something we have to do. We have to put off the things of the world and the things of the flesh. We have to be, when we hear the word, be a doer of it and obey it. And then 1 Peter 1.23 For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is the living and enduring word of God. Hallelujah. So again, the prophets are giving them the word, telling them that, you know, especially in this verse, you can turn things around. Instead of stop sowing to wickedness, stop sowing to your flesh because judgment's going to come. Start sowing to righteousness consistently, not just like one day, okay, we'll do some good deeds and the judgment will go. No, it had to be a total 
turning around of the heart to righteousness. Although we know from history that it didn't happen. So again, seven ways we are to seek Adonai. First, with all our heart. Deuteronomy 4.29. This is something we say every Shabbat. Um, but from there, you will seek the Lord. Your, let's go up a little bit. Um, let's begin with verse 26. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess. You should not live long on it, but will utter, utterly be dis destroyed. Now, if we go on context again, God is telling Israel, if you obey me, you will be blessed. If you listen to my statutes and judgments, you will be blessed. However, if you don't, if you go seeking other gods, it, you are going to be cursed. And even God says, you know, told Moses, you know, they're going to go in there and they're going to turn away from me. Even before they got into the land. Verse 27, the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you out. Again, we see that happening in Hosea. There you will serve gods, the work of man's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, hear, nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and with all your soul. We are to seek him continually. Go to 1 Chronicles 16.11. You know, the word says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, in the minute, you know, uh, Israel, you know, came in contact with pagan lands, the flesh was easily turned away from God. Let me just find First Chronicles here. Okay, First Chronicles 16.11. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. So again, it's a daily seeking, not just an occasional when you know you have a you're up against a wall and you need to be delivered. It's every day to seek him. We need to humble ourselves. Second Chronicles 7:14. This is a well-known scripture that's quoted all the time, and it's actually speaking of Israel, but it's speaking to all of God's people. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So again, God is talking to his people. He says it starts with his people first who are called by his name. We are to hum humble ourselves. We are to pray. We are to seek his face. We are to turn from our wicked ways. Then he will hear. And, you know, again, it had to be Israel as a nation. It has to be America as a nation. I believe we're going to see a, a final outpouring, a final, you know, we're living really in a time of God's mercy and grace right now in this country. You know, God has warned us so many times through so many events. But we, you know, we're still, again, we see more and more um, socialism trying to, uh, push, you know, push its agenda against our freedoms. And if we forsake God, that's exactly what's going to happen. Because this country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles, but really Jewish principles, because Christianity is Jewish. Christian principles are based on Judaism, biblical Judaism. And if we forsake God, and we see that, we see, again, there's a dividing line. There's, there's those that are righteous and are seeking God, and there are those that are totally evil and want to, to annihilate in this country anything that has to do with God. And you can see it in their faces. You know, but we need to continue to pray. And again, of the reason why we have a lot of evil going around in government, because people have become complacent and haven't voted. They don't, as believers, we need to be involved. You know, again, I'm not telling you who to vote for or how to vote, but, you know, we're all accountable to God to, if we just sit back and do nothing and then we have, you know, chaos and anarchy 
and we find ourselves, you know, in prison because of our faith, most of the time it's because we sat and we just thought, oh, well, what will be will be. My vote doesn't count. Well, yes, it does. By prayer, again, we need to be people of prayer. And I go, that's, that's the time that you're going to find the greatest battle. When you're trying to seek time to pray with God, you are going to be hit with more distractions, more physical distractions, more mental distractions. You really have to just find that place uh, where you can get along with God. I was just watching this movie yesterday, The War Room. It's a great movie. I mean, I've probably seen it about 10, 15 times, but it's such a great movie about the power of prayer and changing our situation with prayer. And I'm preaching to myself, too. But we have to pray in faith, believing that our prayers availeth much. Okay, let's go on. By turning from sin, again, Teshuvah, all the prophets, if you study them, to keep on telling Israel, you need to turn from your sin. You have to stop it. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot with God. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Either you're going to serve God 100% or you're going to serve the devil 100%. By preparing our hearts, go to 2 Chronicles 19.3. And again, these notes will be posted on the website for those that are watching on the internet. You'll have to go to the podcast page, and under the audio um, of this teaching will be the PowerPoint. 2 Chronicles 19.3. Well, let's begin with verse 1. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned in safety to his house in Jerusalem. Jehu, the son of Hanai, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord, and so bring wrath on yourself from the Lord? But there is some good in you, for you have removed the Asheroth from the land, and you have set your heart to seek God. So Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem and went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim, and brought them back to the Lord, the God of his fathers. Go to, uh, again, where we need to be diligent. Go to Hebrews um, 11.6. I tell you, it, it takes diligence to be faithful to God because you are going to, especially when you are doing God's will, you're going to come up, you know, with spiritual battles. And, you know, the enemy will do everything to try to, you know, keep you from doing what God's called you to do. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. God doesn't call us to do something without giving us the ability to do it. Hebrews 11. Actually, the whole chapter of Hebrews is a great chapter because it talks about, you know, men and women of faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Other transla translations may say diligently seek him. So ten blessings of seeking Adonai. Uh, if we seek him, he will be found. First Chronicles 28.9. Let's go to that. Okay. And as for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. The word says that he will hear an answer. We saw that again in Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and seek the Lord, He will answer us. We will not lack any good thing. Go to Psalm thirty four. Verses 9 to 10. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For to those who fear him there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. 
But they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Amen. You will bless us with life. Go to Psalm 69.22. Actually, that's the wrong scripture, Psalm 69.22. Um, yeah, that's not the it's not the scripture I was looking for. It must, it must be a typo. Uh, okay, we'll skip that. Go to uh, Amos uh, 5, 4 to 6. I'll fix it in the notes, and then when you get the notes, you'll have this right scripture. Sometimes I... Don't have my glasses on when I'm typing, and I think I'm typing the right thing, and I'm not. Isaiah 5, 4 to 6. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live, but do not resort to Bethel, and do not come to Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity, and Bethel will come to trouble. So here, verse 6, Seek the Lord that you may live. Again, it's telling them, if you seek me, you are going to live. You are going to have life. I am going to bless you. And again, why, you know, you look back and you think, with all the blessings that God gave ancient Israel, why in the world would they want to walk away from him? You know, but we can't underestimate the power of the enemy. We can't underestimate, you know, his lies, and we need to be on guard all the time. Because he'll make us try to think that the world has more to offer to us than God does. And that's a lie. Again, Hosea 10, 12. Let's go back to Hosea. I've been serving him 40 years, and, you know, I've, it's been nothing but a blessing. Yes, have we had trials and tribulations? Yeah, we have. But you know what? God's delivered us from it, from it all. Hallelujah. And he's blessed us. Again, 10, 12. So with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your way in your numerous warriors. Again, he said that he would, he, his glory would be with us. Let's go to Acts Romans 2 7. I'm sorry, Romans 2 7. His glory, which, which is his divine presence. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey, obey unrighteousness, wrath, and, and d indignation. He would uh, bless us with honor. Again, he will honor us. He will give us favor. He will give us his shalom, Psalm 23, eternal life, and also rewards for serving him. Not just rewards in this life, but rewards in the next life when we stand before him. You know, the word says, eyes have not seen or ears have heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Now I'm going to read again, reading from the book um, by Jonathan Kahn, The Mystery of the Shemitah. And as I was reading this particular page, pages 240 to 30, 242, we see what happens when <clears throat> those that are called by God's name, again, God has blessed this country. If you, if you study the history of America, this country has been blessed and has been a blessing. I mean, it's probably, it's helped people all over the world. When there's a need, you know, same thing with, with Israel. They have gone there and they have helped them. But does the world do that for us? No. But we've been a funnel of blessing. And as long as in God we trust, as long as, you know, godliness and the Bible and God's commandments were a part of, you know, of our culture, God blessed us. But now we see this coming, you know, let far and farther away, you know, from our culture. You know, the culture of America has become more carnal and more secular than it ever was when it was first founded. But God still has a righteous remnant within. 
But you know, I believe for, for America, I believe that you know America has been under judgment. You know, it's been subtle, but God has been warning and warning and warning. You know, and I believe we're, you know, and, and Minister Scott felt the same way. This is like our last chance to get it right. To do, you know, but, you know, praise God, Yeshua is returning and we win in the end. We don't have to fear. But, you know, there's people out there that need to be reached for Messiah. And it's really sad when you have a place where people can come. They can learn the Torah. They can learn the truth that they choose not to come. You know, and I'm not talking about people who are sick or people who, who can't make it. But, you know, we've been doing this for 20 years. You know, we've seen people come and go, you know, because they're always looking for the next best, best thing. And they jump from place to place to place, and they are never settled, and they never learn to submit to authority. They never know how learn how to use their gifts to be a blessing to other people and to grow, you know. But we still have to remain faithful. You know, we can't give up no matter what it looks like because God's given us a word to teach and a word to preach, and we're going to do it whether I'm talking to the wall. You know, I mean, I know there's people that listen to us online, but you know what? Chicago has over 6 million people in the Chicagoland area, and they are not in the church. The, poor, the, the amount of people that are in their church are very, maybe 1%. You may have a few mega churches and a few, you know, but again, you know, I've heard different pastors say, you know, are, are, you know, are leaving. But I believe when you're walking in the power of the Spirit, you know, we want everything that God has for us. And that includes the gifts and the power of the Spirit to walk as a first century church walk, to walk in His gifts and the manifestation of His fruit. But they laid down their life. And they didn't, you know, they were persecuted more than we've ever seen in our life. You know, they were threatened with being thrown to the lions, with being burnt at the stake, and it didn't stop them, it didn't shut their mouth. You know, because they knew that, you know, that... There is a greater world to come that they were seeking the kingdom. And that's what we need to keep our eyes on is the kingdom. I know there's times where I would get discouraged. And when I get discouraged, God would send me a word from different places. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. Because if the enemy wants you, yeah, from you, dear, but from other places too. Um, that, you know, I'll just happen to listen to something and they'll be saying, and don't, you know, what they're saying is exactly what I needed to hear. To strengthen me, you know, not to give up. Because I believe that, you know, there are people, especially young people, that are hungry for the truth. So again, we have to be that faithful remnant. You know, and who knows how big that remnant is? I mean, but we have to be faithful, you know, and and not look down at people that are in, you know, in the Sunday churches, because a lot of them are starting to take hold of this and see it and understand it, but be a light and correctly teach the word and be a place where they could learn and, you know, in a place where we can teach the truth and love. And we've learned a lot, you know, we've made our share of mistakes in the ministry, but we've learned, you know, that, you know what, God has called us, and if anybody comes against what God has called us to do, they're going to have to answer to God. That's not my problem. My problem is to be faithful to do what God's called me to do. Hallelujah. So here we see he gives a list of, um, again, the Shemitah. Uh, if Israel, when they kept the Shemitah, they were blessed and uh, their land thrived. I mean, they were, he had three years worth of, you know, food to live off of. God blessed them and prospered them. But when they didn't, again, part of the judgment of Israel is because they didn't, they, they failed to keep seven of the Shemitah years, okay, and that the Babylonian captivity uh, was for part of it, but the, the last week of the tribulation, again, uh, that's last seven weeks, you know, he has to do with the Shemitah as well. You know, I don't claim to understand everything about Revelation, I just know a lot of times with prophecy, you don't understand it until it starts coming to pass, and you go, oh, <laughs> you know, so... Okay, so if the Shemitah is to manifest in the form of judgment concerning America and the American-led world order and the American age, we can expect several things concerning its manifestations. Again, as I'm teaching this, I, it's how can we learn from the past? Because the prophets speak past, present, and future. And we can see as we're studying, we can see a parallel with the same things that happened to Israel why judgment came, we can see that same parallel happening in this country. 
The judgment will affirm the sovereignty of God over all things. The judgment will strike the realm of America's blessings, prosperity, and sustenance, and that of nations. The judgment will involve collapse, and the judgment will lay bare the dependence of America and man on God. In other words, when God strips everything away, people are going to realize that only God is our hope. And isn't it sad that it has to come to that? And he points out in his book, and you really need to read the whole book, that major stock market collapses happened after a Shemitah year. Again, God has blessed this country. I mean, we are blessed to be born here. People from my grandparents, you know, they came through Ellis Island. They came from, you know, uh, Croatia. And they came, you know, they were, um, actually that's where some of my Sephardic, Jewish lines are is through, is through my grandmother, but they came here and they were so grateful for this country. You know, my grandfather owned a, a neighborhood bar on the south side of Chicago. They had nine kids and they lived above that bar. There's three bedrooms with nine. I thought, tell me, Ma, how'd you ever fit this? Because we would go there. It was like a small apartment, but they had like nine kids and the kids helped out in the bar, and it was like a neighborhood, you know, neighborhood bar. They grew in their own grapes. But, you know, I look back and think, wow, you know, it's like, what a, what a, even though I came from a broken home, it's like, you know, our childhood was like so less stressful than it is today, you know. But my parents, they, she, they had a Statue of Liberty, you know, um, clock because you know they came they were so grateful to be in this country and to be blessed and you know they learned how to speak English even though it was broken English you know when they were among themselves they'd speak you know Croatian when they didn't want us to understand what they were saying <laughs> but most you know to us they would speak English and they learned and it was hard for them they weren't highly educated people but you know my grandfather was a very successful you know small business owner in America <laughs> The judgment will separate wealth from the wealthy and positions from the owner. Again, we see when I was reading this, I go, well, that, you know, that sounds like socialism because that's what socialism does. It separates wealth from the wealthy and positions from the owner. What do we hear people spouting now in Congress? That's exactly what they want to do. The judgment will wipe away that which has been built up. The judgment will level imbalances and erase accounts within the nation and among the nations. The judgment will cause a cessation of functioning and an ending within America and in the world. Again, uh, in Revelation when it talks about, you know, Babylon the Great has fallen, some Bible prophecy scholars and teachers think that's referring to America. Okay. I'm not worried about it because I know whose side I'm on. Hallelujah. <laughs> the judge will bear witness against materialism within American civilization and throughout the world. The judge will make clear the link between America's physical and material realm and that of the spiritual. The judgment will release entanglements, attachments, and bondages within the nation and among the nation. The judgment will strike America's economic and financial realms and that of the nations. Again, we've seen some little shakings like that, you know, in the past. You know, the economy, you know, the economy being shaken and, and you know, crashing and then, you know, unemployment and everything. But this, I, I mean, you're talking about like an end time judgment. And I pray that we could turn it around, but you know what it's going to take? Every believer repenting and coming back to the ways of God. The judgment will impact the realms of labor, production, employment, consumption, revenue, and trade. The judgment will cause production, commerce, trade, labor, investment, profit, and trade to cease or severely decrease. Again, these are the warnings that the prophets gave Israel, both the southern and the northern tribes. I mean, Israel, when Israel walked in obedience to God and his Torah, they were blessed. They were prosperous. They were head and not the tail. They were above and not beneath. They lent. They didn't borrow. I mean, everything, all the blessings of Deuteronomy 28 was theirs. But when they fell, God told them, all that will be taken away from you. The judgment will annul, transform, and wipe clean the financial accounts of America and the nations. The judgment will cause credit to go unpaid and debt to be released within America and the world. 
The judgment will wipe away that which is accumulated in, in America's financial realm and that of the world. The judgment will manifest as a sign against a nation that has driven God out of its life. And we can see that, you know, America has, look what's happening to Europe. Europe has driven God out of them years ago. You know, their churches have been turned into like apartment buildings, apartments. And now Islam has taken over Europe. You know, they have driven the God of Israel, you know, out of them. And, and you know, Europe is, is crumbling. The judgment will manifest as a sign against a nation that has driven God out of its life, rejected his ways, and pursued material blessings and idols in his place. Again, as, as I was reading this, I was just kind of weeping in my side for this country. I go, man, if this, you know, as I was reading Jose and stuff, it's, I can see this happening in America. And you can see how different states are going. I mean, there's a division. Those that are going with God's ways and those that are going against God's ways with this abortion issue. You know, and this is one of the states that's going against God's ways that we have to intercede for. The judgment will cast down the objects of Americans' pride and glory. The judgment will touch not only the financial and the economic realms, but every realm of society and life. The judgment will wipe away structure of culture, of systems, and of civilizations. The judgment will wipe away physical realities, and the judgment will alter the landscape of nations and of powers. The judgment will involve and affect the rise and fall of great powers. The judgment will call America back to God. You know, it's you know unfortunate that that's what it takes. You know, you think that that walking in the blessings would make you appreciate God more, but a lot of times it doesn't because people are so caught up in what they have that they forget the reason why they have it is because of God. The Shemitah is a reminder to any nation or civilization that its blessings come from God. And without God, those blessings cannot endure. It is a warning to a nation founded on the purposes of God and blessed by God's hand. But now increasingly warring against the God of its blessings, the Shemitah is a warning, a warning that the nation, that its blessings cannot endure without God. Second Chronicles, again, 7.12. Then Adonai appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself for a house of sacrifice regarding Jerusalem and the temple. If I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, again, why would he do that? Because they've gone away from him. God doesn't send judgment because he feels like it. He sends judgment because we have gone away from him to wake us up. When my people, over whom my name is called, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Again, the key, which are called by my name, or a Hebrew upon whom my name is called, talking to believers, his people. We need to, and you could read the, these scriptures, I, you know, uh, later in the notes, you know, but we need to humble ourselves, we need to pray, we need to seek his face, we need to turn from evil, and then he will hear. God knows when we are just saying things without sincerity. And he knows when we are sincerely saying things from a broken heart and a heart that's crying out to him. You know, and, and my heart and our heart is crying out to him, Father, fill this place with people that are hungry for you. Fill this place with people who want to know your ways and to serve you your way, Father, to be a light. Father, to, uh, to the nations and to their friends. You know, keep, we pray all the time to keep the wolves away. People come in, come in here and they try to drag people away to their own agenda. That is not how you do things. That is against the order of God. If God sends somebody here, then that's where they're supposed to learn. And we see people do that time. They go shopping in other congregations. They've got a ministry, so they go shopping in other congregations for people. Well, why don't you come by me? You know, why don't you come by me? You know, and that's out of God's order. And we need to humble ourselves. We need to, again, Father, where do you want me to be so I can serve you? We're all serving God. You know, we all have a way to serve him. 
And that when we get a group of people that are on fire for God, that want to use their gifts and want to serve Him, we'll see this place turned upside down. We'll see people coming and hungry, see people healed and set free and delivered because that's what we're called to do. Not to be the biggest and the best. That's not our desire. We want to be a place where people can come, receive the word, be discipled, be trained, go out, and that with signs and wonders following them, as the Bible says, the believer shall lay hands on the sick and they will recover. They shall cast out demons. Every believer has an authority. But we have to, as the prophet said, we need to, to take that fallow ground, that hardness of our heart, that bitterness, that unforgiveness, maybe towards other ministers. You know, we always blame our problems on somebody else and not ourselves. You know, and it's like, okay, Father, where did I go wrong? Father, I don't want my heart to be hardened towards you. I don't want my heart to be hardened towards other people. You know, take my heart. You know, take my heart and, and give me your heart. Let me feel what you feel. Let me pray, you know, what is your heart to pray. That's why we need the power of the Ruach HaKadosh. We need the Spirit of God. We need that prayer language to pray and to intercede. Even other